I needed to learn why um, it was that patients were getting so many prescriptions and I knew that we could have better solutions. So I went back to medical school um, and that was, I came out in 2001. So it's been quite a while ago since I've graduated and been practicing as a medical doctor, but I've always continued to do both. Um, I have felt, I, I love being in my lab. I love problem solving. And so my focus has always been on the prevention piece. Starting your route to retirement. Welcome to the Guided Retirement Show. I'm Dean Barber, and it is such a pleasure to have you with me here today. Today's guest is my concierge physician, Dr. Laura Lyle. I've been working with Dr. Laura Lyle now for eight years, and I'm happy to say that I'm in the best health that I've been in in my entire life, all thanks to the preventative care of Dr. Laura Lyle. Dr. Laura Lyle introduced me to a supplement here in back in March of 2020 that she believed had the ability to prevent COVID. And sure enough, I've been exposed. And in fact, I've had my entire family on this formulation and we were all exposed and nobody tested positive for COVID. I'm excited to interview Dr. Laura Lyle. I'm going to encourage you to share this episode with every single person you know and encourage the people that you share it with, to share it with everybody they know. You'll love this interview. Take the time, listen to it thoroughly, and share it with your friends. Enjoy. Dr. Laura Lyle, great to have you here on the Guided Retirement Show. It is normally my favorite thing to talk about is money and financial planning and financial wellness, but today we're going to talk about real wellness, right? And and your company, Lyle Wellness, is actually uh, getting the word out on some pretty amazing things that are happening. I've been a patient of yours for eight years now, and I have to say that the results have been outstanding. Um, and it's, uh, you know, my life is totally different today. At 47 years old, I was really out of shape. I wasn't taking very good uh, care of myself. I had had a, a co-worker of mine take me to the hospital. They thought I was having a heart attack. And I called you and I, because I was referred to you by a good friend of mine. And I said, I got to change my life, right? I got to change stuff. And you've been working with me for eight years and the results are outstanding. So I want you to, first of all, know how much I appreciate what you've done, but I want you to tell your story about why you do what you do. You're a preventative care physician, also a compound pharmacist, and you believe that people can really create their own future by the decisions that they make and I mean the future of their health. So welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Dean. Um, I really appreciate you having me on today. And as I've stated, um, you know, patients like yourself make my job a lot easier because you are vested in your health. You're doing all the things that we ask of you. You asked the question about why I do preventative health. And when I started out in compounding pharmacy in the 80s, um, it was there weren't very many of us. Uh, there were probably 50 or 60 back in the, in the mid to late 80s. And I loved mixing and I loved problem solving. And I went on to open two pharmacies, uh, independent pharmacies. And at that time, over the next decade, I noticed gosh, you know, these patients keep getting prescriptions and then they have to get another prescription for side effects and another. And next thing you know, I realized that maybe they would have been better off just not taking anything at all. And so I really wanted to learn more about that. And it was also a calling to go back to medical school. I had two small children, but I knew that I needed to learn why um, it was that patients were getting so many prescriptions and I knew that we could have better solutions. So I went back to medical school um, and that was, I came out in 2001. So it's been quite a while ago since I've graduated and been practicing as a medical doctor, but I've always continued to do both. Um, I have felt, I, I love being in my lab. I love problem solving. And so my focus has always been on the prevention piece. We were compounding uh, vitamin D3 15, 20 years ago. Um, there weren't vitamins over the counter. And I just knew that when we could get a solution early on and get somebody in the preventative phase, it made more sense than waiting and being on the defense. And unfortunately, what I did learn in medical school is that we don't learn about the medications. We learn about the diagnosis, which 
has to happen. But unfortunately, we look up, we were taught to look, okay, we have a diagnosis, let's now go look up what medication to prescribe. And those medicines are usually a synthetic, you know, prescription medication. And so the reality is, um, let's not get to that point. Let's yeah. get people earlier. Exactly right. And and I love that approach. And, you know, I have to tell you that, that, that I run into people all the time, uh, obviously, and they're, and they're like, how old are you, Dean? And I, I'll tell them I'm 55. And they're like, oh, my gosh, how how, how are you so healthy? How, how do you do all the things that you do? And then I, I got to tell the story about Dr. Laura Lyle and, and what she's done for me. So um, go to lylewellness.com and uh, check out the website there and learn all about uh, what Dr. Laura Lyle here is doing. So, so talk about some of the preventative things. What, what did you say? You said D3, right? And I don't know that everybody listening is going to know what is D3, but you have me taking something called D3 with K2, right? Which I'm not sure that I actually understand the science behind that, but talk, talk about some of the things that you see happening and why these supplements are so critical. You, you told me about a a, a male going through a very long menopausal cycle, right? So the kind of like women, it happens pretty quick, but men, it's a, a very prolonged period of time. And what happens in that is your body starts making some of the things that you need in order to stay healthy. So talk a little bit about some of that science. So, you know, I think most women are very aware um, of menopause and the, I call it falling off a cliff. So in women, typically the average course of a hormonal change and uh, impact is much more noticeable in men. And we've talked about this starting at age 35, we see this gradual decline. And so in a lot of men, they don't realize maybe their joints are hurting or their fatigue or they're not as focused. Um, you know, I've had so many like CEO type um, men in my practice who just didn't feel like they were on top of their game, maybe the way that they had been before. And so um, it is a different course. And in men, it's called andropause. But I've always had an interest in balancing things much, very tedious, right? It's not just about getting your testosterone checked. It's about making sure that we're checking your hemoglobin, your estrogen. Most men don't know they even have estrogen that we need to. I didn't know until, <laughs> <laughs> until you pointed out, right? Well, and I always gently put that into the conversation because, you know, most men, um, I get a look of shock when I'm in person with them, you know, what? I have estrogen? <laughs> So, you know, one of the things that I believe is that everything in, in the human body is tied together. And I am a little bit like a stockbroker in the aspect that I love numbers and I look at trend analysis, but I don't look at just one number. I'm looking at all of your data. I'm looking at all of the different factors and we want to get everything aligned because we know that we can impact health span. We can impact that time in your life where we don't want to all just grow old and you know not and be disabled. We want to grow old with quality of life. It's not just length of life. And so in doing so, we'll we'll start optimizing patients. And what most people don't realize is that their numbers are normal by most um, of our standards because it's a fifth to 95th percentile. So, um, again, yeah, so, so say that again. So if you're in the 95th percentile or in the fifth percentile, you, you're or anywhere in between there, you're saying that's normal, but that's a broad span. Truly. And let's face it, what's normal for you. So if you don't have the retrospective numbers to evaluate, just like in the stock market, how do you know what to predict? How do you know if it's going up or down? So, by looking at the trends, we have the ability to actually follow a person and know what's normal for you. But the key is if you get your blood work done at your doctor and they do the basic things, uh, regular testing, not anti-aging uh, blood work, you won't get a call if there's not an H or an L for high and low. And the bottom line is, you know, for example, uh, vitamin B12 is 250 to 1100. So if you're 251, you're normal. And yeah. obviously I don't think it takes much to understand. You may be normal, but you're very low and it needs replaced. So, and so instead of looking at normal, high or low, you're looking at optimum. What, what is the optimum levels of all of these different chemicals within our body and, and where should we be? 
Exactly. And, and in some, we're trying to get you in that 90th, 95th percentile for that range, depending on what we're looking at. But we're not just looking at cholesterol and we're not just looking at, um, okay, uh, most of the, sometimes I'll look at thyroid, but we're looking at aging, markers of aging and wellness. So I'm looking at, for example, on blood sugars. I don't want to just see your fasting blood sugar. We talk about your A1C, your three month average of blood sugar, because it's a better indicator. And also we know by keeping that below 5.7, we're going to lower your overall cancer risk. And and I think in a time of COVID, we also can see now that even pre-diabetes will um, put you at risk for having hospitalization. So by optimizing, I'm preparing your body to be able to handle insult. I often say to patients, look, if we can get A's or in honors courses, because I run pretty tight ship, I, as you know. Yes. <laughs> you know, we like to really fine tune and dig into those numbers. But the beauty is when you see cause and effect from your lifestyle and from the supplements, then you start to feel better, but you also see the objective data. That then will help you during times of pandemics. It'll help you if, God forbid, you're in a car accident. And, you know, what if you didn't know you had low iron? Or what if you didn't know you were diabetic? You know, having all that information information um, and everything optimized just allows you to have better outcome, not just for longevity. And so how often do you suggest that people get their blood work done? What do you, what do you think is optimum in the normal kind of person out there? Should this, should this, I mean, most doctors are going to say, well, come in once a year, we'll do a checkup, right? That's a long time. It's a very long time. Do you know how much happens in a year? A year ago, we didn't hear about COVID, right? Right. (laughs) I mean, I've had a lot of happen in my last year getting married and, you know, all the stressors of those things, meeting the Pope. Uh, so we have to understand that blood work will alter based on the stress in our life. It'll alter if we gain five pounds, 10 pounds, or if we lose 10 pounds. So I do not feel once a year is a safe way to look at blood work. If we are going to be healthcare advocates and we are going to promote healthcare, we need to have that blood work at least twice a year. And that would be like, at least, because how do you get data points? I prefer to have it three to four times a year, depending on where you're at in your own personal health and wellness. Well, I know, we yeah, and I know when you and I first started, I was a train wreck, and you said, okay, <laughs> every quarter, right? We're doing this every quarter, and and it wasn't just that I got the blood work done; it was that you and I would then spend, you know, forty five minutes to an hour on the phone talking about what's going on and how these different supplements have changed this and things are looking better. Now let's keep doing this or let's change a couple of things. And, and, and it didn't take long. I mean, we were maybe three quarters into it and you had figured out what I needed to be doing and optimize things. And that that's when I really started to see the big difference. And, and I haven't stayed, I mean, I, I don't do it four times a year anymore because you and I both agreed three times a year is probably adequate for, for where I'm at because you know, I'm regimented and I follow your instructions, right? Absolutely. And that's exactly right. You know, there's going to be early on, we need more of those data points. We need to get things corrected. But when we do things, see things stabilize, I always say you can graduate to maybe twice a year. If you're um, a little bit older, like 80 year olds, most of the time, 70, 80, you know, if they've been with us for 10, 15 years, and we have a lot of data points, unless if something traumatic happens, then we can push that blood work out a little bit. But once a year makes no sense um, to me at all. I, I believe we have to know what's going on in our body because sometimes remember we're not waiting to get symptoms we're trying to prevent that problem yeah so is there a if there was an ideal age that somebody should start utilizing your preventative care services what would that be so if you asked me that question 10 years ago i would probably say 40s but you know we've now have generations of families i think it's great when you're um going to college to get it once a year i'm saying that because at least we're getting some data points and what we're finding is they actually may not be overly compliant but they're learning what they need to be doing and when they get out in the real world then they are this is becoming part of their lifestyle it's part of of the way they do it but of course if if someone can get their blood work when they're feeling great um in their 30s and you know just start getting some of those early data points but and it- as we start to get into the aging process and I'm older than you, Dean, so I can I can honestly. It's always good to have your doctor older than you, right? Exactly. Yeah. And- <laughs> you look ten years younger, though. 
<laughs> Bless your heart. Uh, so, um, you know, the key is getting as early as possible established, but especially in women, if you're feeling great, what a great time to get your blood work. And most people don't think of it that way. They wait until they're having problems with their hormones or not feeling well, then they go in. Yeah. So is there a point at which it's too late? Never too late. The oldest patient that came into my practice, uh, 93 year old male, uh, came to me for anti aging. And that's um, funny. He- it's pretty, it was a really unique situation. And he, he, of course, interviewed me because he wanted to make sure he could have his scotch once a day. <laughs> and of course, at 93, we're not taking that away. Um, but he lived to be almost 100, 102 plus and just passed away in the past year. Um, and just a beautiful quality of life. The man was not really walking a lot. He was having poor quality of life, felt fatigue. He was able to go on a sailboat with his family in the Bahamas and, you know, the quality of life that he had. So it's never too late. Never. And so you had somebody at 93 come to you for anti-aging. anti-aging. And, but, but, and what you saw, the results, what you're saying is you changed that man's last nine years of his life. It changed the, not only the last nine years of his life, um, it changed the family's last nine years of his life. I was able to attend, I take care of all the generations, all the way down to the great grandchildren in that family. And it was so beautiful to watch when he turned a hundred, we would have these milestones, you know, and to watch the birthday party and his ability to interact and have the mental capacity to interact, not just physically. So it, it, it truly is, I love what I do. You know that, Dean. I, I mean, I love being able to help direct the trajectory of individual lives and improve. All right. So you knowledge. got you got to you got to tell me you did not use the synthetic <laughs> no drugs, right? <laughs> no, no. He was on supplements. He was on testosterone, which was at the time um, unheard of. We talked about that, you know, and it was very interesting uh, tweaking him. And again, remember every person's different. And so, you know, what we know in some of these 80, 90, 100 year olds, um, that we have actually lower amounts needed, right, to get the same therapeutic results, because we have to make sure that we don't enlarge their prostate and we don't do other things. We had to balance his estrogens out and keep his sugars down, but not with prescription medications, no. And I believe that by fine tuning everything, if he has go in the hospital or had any illness, we were able to have him recover very quickly. Again, he was optimized. The big pharmaceutical companies have to hate you. I think so. Yeah. But it's, they're, they're selling many medications. So, um, you know, all we can do is continue to get the word out. And, you know, a lot of people say to me, like, why do I need supplements? why like can i just eat healthy i eat healthy but i think it's important dean for people to understand that um because of the environment we live in the environmental toxins the oxidative stress gosh we're all under a lot of emotional stress now right that impacts things in our life and you've even seen that on uh, some ups and downs in your blood work we'll notice cortisol will push sugars up if you're under a really stressful time and so i think People need to realize the quality and nutrients within our food is not the same. So we have to replace these things because if we don't, that's why we see some of these disease states. And it's like a one plus one equal 10. So if you're low on D3 or if you're low plus you're low or high on inflammation markers, the one plus one equal 10, meaning it's exponentially more of a problem for you. So inflammation, talk, talk a little bit about that, because I, that's not something I think people really think about internal inflammation in their body. They can see it if it's external, but t- what do you mean in, in inflammation internally? Wow. So inflammation, huge. And you may have even been hearing about it in the news cycle with the cytokine storm. That's all pro-inflammatory things that are happening in people's body that's getting them really sick and into intensive care with COVID. So day in day out we have inflammation in our body it could be i decided to have a donut last night or you know our body can get inflamed from certain foods we eat it can get inflamed from certain medications we're taking a lot of people think of inflammation as joint pain they think oh i injured myself when i was at crossfit 
oh, I have inflammation. Yes, you have localized inflammation. The inflammation I'm talking about, I check something called C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is systemic. It's in your bloodstream. And we know if we can keep that down below one, we are dramatically dropping healthcare risks, including cancer risks. And so it is a very important tool for us to continue to follow. And everyone really should know their C-reactive protein level. And but you know I'm sitting here talking to my co-host on America's Wealth Management Show, and I'm telling him I'm showing him I said look here's what here's what Dr. Lau does. Let me show you all of the different things that she's she's looking at on a regular basis. How many doctors are going to go? Hey, let's go check your C-reactive protein. <laughs> Probably not a lot, unless if you ask. Um, there are more doctors that are starting to work in this arena, but here's the thing. Without data points every time, how can we get the predictive value? So what has happened over the years, I started doing this, believe it or not, from nuns teaching me to look at it this way. Can you believe that? Back That's interesting. Back in 2003. Yes, um, I was the first medical director for Sister Servant Immaculate Heart of Mary, and they had 350 retired nuns, average age 86, and they had never had a medical director, and they were waiting on a woman, and there weren't any women MDs in the area, so they approached me, and I, I opened my clinic and take on this big project. Well, every Friday, the nuns would come to a clinic, and they were bored these women are so smart and they started graphing a couple of them would graph their blood sugars they would graph their blood pressures they would graph numbers because they real and and i would get so excited I'm like wow that was so helpful what a difference that made and so in a community like that they all eat meals together everybody started chatting dr laura loves graphs next thing you know everybody's graphing for me <laughs> so then when i went to practice in the hospital like i'd be in the intensive care with a patient and they'd say oh dr lyle this liver enzyme's quite high and I'm like was well, it going up or is it going down because i really can't make a medical decision without that and so from that point forward um i started doing all graphing and looking at the trend analysis because it is so important to see the different things together because if you have you can see cause and effect and that's really where we are able to find associations that are in medical journals maybe five seven years later um, which we've already knew you know for example if somebody's taking um, over-the-counter uh, pepsid and those types of medications or protonix and uh, prilosic um, I always knew, hey, your magnesium's getting low. Hey, your B12's low. Well, why? Well, it's because you're not able to absorb because of the, the lack of acid. So, and then, you know, they'll publish five years later. Oh, by the way. <laughs> but we're seeing it because if you have all the numbers, that's how you're going to be able to see the changes. That That's interesting that you say that because I never associated the two things together. But before I uh, started being your patient, I used to have heartburn all the time. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't exist. It, it's sure. just not there. And, and you're saying it's because of what? Well, I'm saying that, um, first of all, getting your body healthy. So getting the right bacteria, getting your everything aligned in your body. Your gut health is your immune system. People don't realize that. So when you have heartburn, that can be a sign of just simple reflux in your diet. But it also can be a sign that things are um, out of balance. And so if we can get your inflammation down and we can put back the things that are needed, things start working better. Interesting. So. Interesting. All right, let's switch gears a little bit here. You are on the, I'm going to mess up the way to say it, but the COVID uh, Council for the Vatican. So talk to us about how did that come about? Tell me about your, your trip to the Vatican and the work that you're doing. Sure. So um, you did well with that. It's the emergency COVID-19 um, commission. I thought you, you were pretty close on that, Dean. Okay, good. <laughs> So uh, last fall in November, on November 9th, actually, I was uh, had a private audience with Pope Francis. I was selected to come over for a few days and what they say they were courting me. Um, and in doing so, I had the, the privilege of meeting Pope Francis one on one. And part of that reason, often people are like, well, how did that happen? Well, having um they're looking for women in leadership they're also pope francis is very much driven towards a more natural holistic approach and so was looking for um a pharmacist or somebody with that knowledge and many don't realize that pope francis was actually a chemist before he was a priest interesting i did and, not know that either yeah, 
And um, he actually had a compounding chemist in a lab, a nutrition lab in Argentina that was very influential in his life. And um, so when you think about um, the interesting overlays <clears throat> in our life, it's pretty fascinating. So I was called in for my expertise in the preventative health and natural um, health, uh, because this is not an area they had had anyone to be able to promote within. Um, and I presented uh, to the Vatican, and I'm happy to report that in February, uh, Pope Francis adopted a platform of global health and wellness, and, and his platform is resetting healthcare using a natural, holistic approach. Um, I couldn't be much Wouldn't happier. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So I was invited back in uh, March, which of course um, was waylaid because of COVID. We couldn't actually get out of the country. Um, so as soon as um, it was open to fly, which was the end of June. Um, I flew back over to the Vatican to complete. I was going to start working within the convent, um, within the Vatican, the nuns, and also helping with um, looking, evaluating some of the hospitals with Order of Malta. And um, so I went back and I was there the end of July, end of June, beginning of July. And at that time, um, it, I was appointed uh, to the emergency uh COVID-19 commission, which I take as a huge honor. And um, I have been working extensively with COVID-19, as you know, um, I'm committed to trying to change um, the trajectory of all of this. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll tell a story about uh, back in, I think it was March, you and I talked. Um, I remember because I was sitting on my dock at the lake house and talking to you and you, you're saying, Dean, you've been a bad boy. You, you, you haven't been necessarily, you know, taking the best care. Maybe, maybe I uh, had a few too many drinks during the first part of COVID. I was cooped up and all this. And you said, here's something I think you should do. Here's something I think you should take. And, and you introduced me to uh, uh, a new supplement that I hadn't been taking called Proimmune 200. And you said, Dean, I think that this Proimmune 200 can help prevent people from getting COVID. And so I'm like, all right. Well, tell me how that works. So tell everybody that's listening or watching how, how does, what does the Proimmune 200 do and how do you think it can help people prevent COVID or if they get it, prevent them from getting critically ill? Well, let me say first and foremost, I call it immune formula, but it, it doesn't matter. But, um, but the, you know, what's so amazing is, um, I believe in divine intervention. And, you know, uh, I met a scientist that worked in the Vatican in the 70s. And after my work at the Vatican in January, he reached out to me and um, he was a chemist and a um, um, psychiatrist. And he had done a lot of work with natural supplements and it had nothing to do with COVID. It was about looking at intracellular glutathione. And he had figured out how to get our body to make its own intracellular glutathione. Now, I get overly excited about that because I have spent decades working with glutathione and trying to get your our own body's levels up. Well, the only way we've been able to do that is by IV, uh, which we could not give continuously. That is not easy to do. So usually when somebody's super sick, we might use it for an immune boosting property. But we tried it topically and we knew that it shut down your own body's ability to make glutathione. So although we knew that it was almost, I don't want to call it the holy grail, but it had a lot of really great things with longevity and health and wellness and viral syndromes, we couldn't really give it on a regular basis. Well, as soon as I started reading the research on this, I was astounded because as you know, Dean, I love supplements. Yes. And I have been working with them since 1987. And uh, at a, like I said, before even people had supplements, I was hand making them. And I am so excited about what has been discovered because it truly is the simplicity of what has been made. It's three amino acids, three. It's L-cysteine, it's L-glycine, L-glutamine, and a small amount of selenium as a spark plug, as I say, to kind of ignite it if needed in the cell. But if you think about it, the beauty is we have this one enzyme in our cell. And believe me, that enzyme, you don't want to override it because its whole job is to say, do you need glutathione or don't you? And the way he formulated this, it gives the cell everything it needs to make intracellular glutathione. But if you don't need it at the time, 
your body won't make it. So the, why is it important right now? Because it has two very unique properties. Uh, first of all, it's well known in the literature that it has excellent um, impact with viruses. Um, you're the talking about the, the glutathione has. The glutathione, yeah. Okay. So glutathione has been studied. It's not some revelation you know, that we're having. It's just we couldn't get it. He's figured out how to get it in the body. But there's 3,761 studies on viruses and the impact, positive impact of intracellular glutathione uh, in our PubMed research. So this is evidence-based research. Um, so I, I'm just very excited to have the opportunity to get this into our patients because I know what a game changer it is for the world. Well, when you when you said that, and then I'm like, okay, well, I'll try it. I didn't understand what glutathione was. That was the first time I'd ever heard the word and didn't understand that that was my body's own uh, ability to fight off viruses um, and, and to maintain good health. And I didn't realize when you introduced me to it in March that you had just learned about it in January either, which is pretty amazing that we were able to get together and, and uh, start on that. But my experience with it has been really quite astounding. Um, I had, uh, we had a big 4th of July party and I have a son, I have like two sons that live in Florida and they both flew back with their girlfriends. Well, one of the girlfriends before she left, she thought she had a sinus infection because she had a really severe headache. And she went to the clinic and the, they, they said, well, we don't think you have a sinus infection. We're going to test you for COVID. So they did a quick test on her and the quick test came back negative. And then they did the nasal swab and they said, it'll take, you know, five to seven days before we'll have the results of the nasal swab. And she said, look, I'm getting on an airplane. I'm going to my boyfriend's family and I want to make sure I'm okay to fly. What are the chances that if I'm negative with the quick test that I'm positive with the nasal swab? And the person there says, oh, don't worry about it. Just, it it's highly unlikely. Go ahead and get on the plane, you know, go do your thing. Well, five <clears throat> or six days later that they'd been with us, right? We played cards together. We ate together. We drove in a car for three and a half hours together. We were with this young lady, you know, nonstop in a very, very close environment. Nobody was social distancing. We weren't wearing masks. And she got the test back from the nasal swab and said she was positive. And so I called you immediately, right? I called you immediately and you said, I don't think you're going to get it. I did. I believed it wholeheartedly that you would not get it. And I didn't. I know how compliant you are. <laughs> and I didn't. And I didn't. And nobody on my family did because we'd all been taking that Proimmune 200 or the, uh, what do you call it? I call it immune formulation, but that's okay. Yeah. But anyway, anyway uh, and, and nobody in my family got it. And so I'm like, why in the world are we not talking about this in mainstream media? If this is something that's so simple that it's our body's own ability to fight off this virus and we can boost the glutathione levels or the ability for your body to make the glutathione to fight off the virus? Why are, why is it everybody not doing this? Well, and I think that's my mission is to get everybody doing this. But if you think about it, the majority of where the dollars and research is, is in the 20% that are gravely ill in the hospital. So we're looking at hydroxychloroquine. We're looking at remdesivir. We're looking at people that are already in the hospital. So, you know, out of a hundred patients, 20 may have to be hospitalized and of that a small percentage into the ICU and, and on ventilators. But that's where all the emphasis is. That's Western medicine approach because we wait until you're sick and then we treat. And that's, so that's the mentality where we really need to be focusing is on that 80% and optimizing your immune system and keeping you out of the hospital and better yet, let's prevent it. And that's exactly what intracellular glutathione I'm so excited about because not only does it work as a master antioxidant to help decrease your own oxidative stress, which most of us have at this time. I mean, we're all, you know, living pretty stressful these days. Um, so we need to get that down, but also glutathione has the ability to decrease uh, viral loads by chelating or binding um, the zinc, zinc, nickel, and iron. And those are the key elements that feed um, aggressive messenger RNA viruses. And so for example, and it, and it was my belief immediately when, you know, seeing how glutathione worked, well, gosh, you know, if I got exposed, wouldn't it make sense if I had really good intracellular glutathione levels 
I have something that can not let that virus replicate. So even if two people got exposed, it was my theory and belief that the person that had good glutathione levels, that would not allow that virus to replicate as much. And it's, we know, and it's factual and in the, the science that if we don't do that and we allow that, it's your viral load in your bloodstream and your cells that's going to cause more um, health si significant symptoms. And so, um, you know, I just, we've now had over a thousand patients. It expands every day. Um, this is observational data at this point. We are excited to, uh, uh, really pushed to get into a phase three clinical trial because in this country, even though this product is FDA accepted for everything I've said, decreasing oxidative stress, increasing intracellular glutathione, to get it identified in this country, it really needs to be called a medicine. Even if it's over the counter, we need to move towards that because that is how how our system works here. There's nothing prohibiting people to, from taking it now. And that's my mission is to get this into as many people as possible because we don't have to live in fear. And you know, that's my premise. Yeah. I, I, well, and, it, and so the, let, let's talk about that, that 20% or the people that have become infected with COVID-19. So you told me when we were on the phone that day and I, and I talked to you about my son's girlfriend, you said you have her start taking it right away. And you believed that within 48 to 72 hours, her symptoms would be gone. Yes. And, and it was and 48 first, hours and she was like, Oh, I've got all my energy back. I feel better. My headache's gone. And yeah. so is there, so for these people that are getting really sick, can they start taking this right away? Absolutely. We've had now at a hundred, referred COVID patients, much like your um, son's girlfriend that are referred to us. And we're like, get on this up, you know, take it at a little bit higher dose three times a day. And we're seeing a significant, we've had all, we've not had one hospitalization and some of these patients are very ill. I mean, we've got patients in their eighties. We've got people with AFib and stroke history and severe diabetes. And these are the people that land in the hospital normally. So, you know, being able to keep people out of the hospital is key, not only for our healthcare system, but also to be able to have quick recovery. Because if you can drop the viral load, if you can empower your body to fight this and empower your immune system, we're all going to be better at getting over this. And quite honestly, I believe that it'll be with influenza as well this fall. Yeah. You know, so uh, to me, this is so exciting. Where where are you at with the, the studies on this? Have you done you talked about a phase three clinical trial. Have you done phase one, phase two? Who are you yeah, working phase with? One and phase two are all completed. Uh, FDA is already, this is a product that's available. That's, we're in a very unique situation. Remember, most of the time when you're in a pandemic or something, a, a world crisis, you can't do, um, they pull things out of the freezer, uh, meaning um, you have to have something that's readily available. Okay. And this and is so readily available. Yes, exactly. That's why they grabbed hydroxychloroquine and tried to repurpose and look at it because you can't do a phase one, phase two and have people dying in a pandemic. You need to take something that already has passed the, the testing that it's needed in order to get it into a human clinical trial. And so that's why remdesivir, you know, it was used in Ebola. It was used it, not overly successful, but, you know, it was used in the past. So it already had been approved to be used in humans. This product has been available and is very safe for, uh, matter of fact, I don't know of any drug interactions um, or contraindications, um, you know, except for if somebody's in aggressive chemotherapy. The only reason I would say not using it then is because the whole point of chemotherapy is to, is to increase oxidative stress. It's trying to put your body into war and you don't want to you know, dampen that if you're trying to do aggressive treatments. But past that, even right after the chemo, getting right on board with it, because it truly, it just makes sense. So we are now in the phase of, we most likely will do one in the US and one out, and we're working through all those steps, but it isn't necessary to do so, patients can still do it. I believe that it needs to be done to get it to the medical communities, to get it published in the journals, because in our country, that is critical. It's, how long it's, How long do you think that'll take? We're dealing with uh, politics <laughs> and the government. I'm my, Once we get moving on it, I believe we can get things wrapped up in three months. Um, so, you know, we're just now in the IND, the uh, 
phase, which you have to do. In, it's quite complex, Dean. This is a whole new ball game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but the, the, um, there's no, this is my point in my platform right now. Um, you know, we're looking to launch a study, a phase three clinical trial in Rwanda, uh, because we can get that expedited uh, a little faster. I'm, I'm hedging to get both going um, and whichever one is done um, faster will help to get this accelerated um, into the uh, media. We're still publishing and getting ready to publish our case studies and our observational data, uh, opinion letters and papers, um, because we have to, we've had, we've had to take these past five or six months and do a lot of things. We've had to follow the science and the science is pointing 100% to people with increased oxidative stress and people with decreased immunity are at risk. Period. And this, this does, and this fixes both of those things. That's right. The science is showing, you know, that um, we can do something about this. And now there's studies coming out. Just this past week, University of North Carolina talked about uh, selenium, which is one of the cofactors, and um, patients, and it talks about the glutathione pathway. The science is, catch, you know, already even talking, and that's with COVID nineteen. We, you know, now that we're getting very detailed studies, there was one out of Russia. The title of the study literally said endogenous glutathione deficiency as the most probable cause for severe illness and death in COVID-19. You know, I Doesn't read that. that. I, I actually, I actually read that because I, yeah. w once you put me on this, I'm like, I got to understand this glutathione. So I just Googled and I actually found that uh, study that's, that was really right. fascinating. It is. And so we're going to keep spreading the word in the medical community. But remember, people get beat up right now in the media. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's a rough road <laughs> out there, but we're we're not allowing that to stop getting because I, I am committed. And, you know, in outside of the country, you know, I'm already have met in Italy and I've been to the Vatican talking and, you know, it's a little bit different parameters. Um, is it moving have. faster? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, we have we have checks and balances in place. And I believe our FDA was not really ever set up to deal with public health crisis. It's there to keep people safe for diagnostic and uh, for medications. We're in a very unique situation. And I believe that it's amazing that there's already something that's FDA accepted. That Absolutely. Yeah. And it says right on the bottle. I saw it. I got to take it every day. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yes. Very excited. And, you know, when I really dug into the, the the part that really struck me and i did a talk uh, a couple weeks ago about this and with a slide and I, if i could show it i would but picture this three amino acids just in a, a chain that is the simplicity of what we're talking about your own body's antiviral ability to help your immune system remdesivir has 25 steps to make it 25 it has over 70 raw materials. It takes nine months to 12 months to make. And you know why? Because one of those processes in there, there's a very dangerous to humans and it has to be made in a chemical reactor, stainless steel in Canada. Wow. Really? Doesn't sound very safe. My point is, if you look at the complexity of this, is that really something I want to put in my body? Of course, if I'm in the intensive care and, you know, and I'm, I'm at my last breath, you know, anything at that point, maybe that's a good choice at that point. But do I want to put something that is not safe for humans in one of the pathways? Absolutely not. And it doesn't, this is where we are putting all of our faith in, you know, these medicines. These are end of life, in my opinion. You know, it would have to be like, okay, there's nothing else I can do right now. I need to use this. The other point that I want to make is that $3,120 for one patient to be treated, that is not the hospital cost. That is not the nursing cost. That's just the drug itself. That's the vial. Yeah. And we can treat eight years, one patient for eight years with the immune formulation preventatively. Crazy. It's astounding. Crazy. So what about, uh, what, what about the hydroxychloroquine? So the moment they announced that, I, I, I probably said some verbal things to the television and, and said, what? <laughs> Remember, I've been a pharmacist a lot of years. So I knew right away that it could be a potential treatment in the right patient. This gets back to what we do, Dean. They're trying to do a one size fits all. Hydroxychloroquine is not a good fit for everyone. And if you have a cardiac history, 
there are concerns and that's what's finally coming to light even psychiatric um you know some of the mental health issues that can come with that we can't give this to the masses and i've said this before in order for something that's going to turn this um pandemic around it has to be safe for everyone it has to be effective it has to be cost effective which we know and it has to be able to to be globally administered so that all can use it from a cost standpoint and those criteria are not being met with remdesivir and and hydroxychloroquine it's it is a choice at the right time, but again, that's when we're sick. What do you Not know about some of the other vaccines that are being worked on right now? You, I'm sure you're up on all of them, but what? What? Tell us what you're. <laughs> well, um, there's, you know, they're doing the trials. They're in phase three, I believe. Two companies now are in phase three. Um, it, as a matter of fact, when I was in my office in Michigan, the news station um, had this woman coming out of Henry Ford, and she was. She said, "I just took." the vaccine and the news commentator said, well, what made you decide to be, you know, doing this experimental phase? And she said, oh, I don't want to get COVID. And I commend, I mean, I think we have to have volunteers, but they need 30,000 in the study. Problem right now is they're not getting enough minorities in the study to make this, you know, they're not sure. My concern is this. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to rush a vaccine. And I feel like we are jumping over steps as much as possible to get this out because everybody's hanging on a vaccine. And side effects um, are a concern to me. Um, I just read recently, I think they're gonna allow down to 50% efficacy um, and it will pass. Um, I read in Russia, uh, they skipped phase three and they're using one now, a vaccine. Um, I read the same are, thing, yeah. Yeah, these are steps that I'm not comfortable. There's five companies to my knowledge that are at this point of uh, using it. Um, these human challenge uh, trials that they're talking about using with AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, um, I'm quite concerned. Um, they said they were willing to do that, but that's basically, we're infecting someone with the virus and then seeing you know, after they get the vaccine, you actually infect them with the virus, you know. Yeah. Scary. It is scary. Uh, it's not, in my opinion, and you'll get a lot of different doctors talking about this, but I think the ethics is challenging. And, and, to, and to this date, it wasn't done in the U.S., And but there's talk about it, whether it will or not. But bottom line, Dean, it's one strain. Yeah. So what are we uh, what are we seeing uh, you, over in Italy? Let's Because they were really hit hard early haven't heard a lot of news um, about other countries and what's going on with COVID there. All we're hearing about is how horribly it's being managed here in the United States. And so tell me about the difference in what you're seeing in other countries versus what we're seeing here. It's vast difference um, there. You know, Italy's on a slight uptake, but there's no fear of that. It's a very different um, mindset. When I was over in Italy uh, last month, I flew out the day that they banned U.S. passports. Thankfully, I had written permission, you know, medical uh, traveling with the Vatican, uh, was able to get over there. But I, w I didn't know what I was going to face. And I was shocked when I faced a very calm environment. People aren't talking about COVID at the cafes. They're, it, it's relaxed. Um, they understand uh, what they need to do, and they're, they're using good judgment. The fear is not there. It's not on the news stations. Um, I then had to fly and hell, uh, was laid over in Amsterdam and spent a day in Amsterdam. Very, I don't recall seeing any masks except for at our hotel, and it was an international chain, which was mandated uh, by the company and corporate. Um, but it's, very um, mind boggling to me that um, all of a sudden I was afraid to come back to the United States. I was in Rome for a week. And by the time I would listen to the news that was in English that I could understand, I turned to my husband and said, should we go back? It's gotten so much worse. I can't believe it. Well, it's just the perception of what was being portrayed. It, we came back to the exact same thing. Um, I was also on a call with many leaders in the Middle East and um, you know, again, you've got Jordan, Saudi Arabia, all these countries, and they're also looking at, okay, what can we do better next time? They're, it's just not this fear factor that I'm seeing here. I, I, I seem to think and, and notice that the death rate has declined precipitously since this thing came out, and they keep counting the numbers, X number infected, and I'm like, why don't we talk about the people that are getting zero symptoms, uh, mm -hmm. that are perfectly healthy, 
and the people that have fully recovered and the fact that we have figured out how to treat it much better and the death rate now looks not even as bad as the normal flu. No, it's it's definitely declined. Um, and here's the thing. Somebody asked me recently, what would you like a newscaster to ask as a question? I would like them to ask how many people, I would like to ask them, how many people are in the ICU on ventilators that went that are healthy, that had taken care of themselves, had uh, decreased oxidative stress, balanced, how many of those are dying? Because what we need to be focusing on is how many people are, like you say, surviving and are thriving. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, because there is a positive side to, to this. And I try to look for that positive side all the time. And a lot of it's thanks to, you know, my relationship with you and the ability to understand, you know, what I can be doing individually. And I think that that's where we need to put the focus is what can we as individuals be doing to improve our health? to allow our body to do what it's designed to do to fight off these nasty things that come out and they're 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 there every day right this isn't oh, absolutely you know, it, and we're seeing a big decline um in in the southern hemisphere they just had a report profound drop in flu vaccination or you know flu viruses uh cases like usually be 20,000. It's like a thousand something. This is a big difference, partly because we are social distancing and we are trying to do so. We, they, the predictions are there will be less uh, uh, this fall anyway of the flu. But, you know, I just really believe that if people understood moderation, this is not the time to go on extreme dieting. Okay. Whether you're you're fasting for three days or you're eating a high fat diet because you're depressed and you're overeating. This is a time for moderation. Get fresh fruits and vegetables. Don't overdo it with your exercise if you haven't been exercising regularly. If you are just sitting on the couch watching Netflix all the time, we need to get out and move. These are the things we have the power to, to decrease our oxidative stress and also getting um, our psychological mindset. We have to stay positive. Absolutely. I want to tell everybody again, how do you find the, um, we, I'm going to call it the Pro-Immune 200 just because that's what's on my bottle. I see it every every day when I take it. Uh, LyleWellness.com, uh, LyleWellness.com. And uh, you can also find a link in the show notes to LyleWellness.com. You just click that link and there's a space there where you can order the uh, Pro-Immune 200 uh, or immune formulation, whatever. That's what Dr. Lyle likes to call it. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's critical. So let, I want to ask, uh, just a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll let you get back to doing what you're really good at, which is uh, preventative care and helping people stay healthy. Um, what's your opinion of the mask? Is that effective or is it non-effective? And don't, so don't be, I, don't, don't give me a political answer. <laughs> yeah, I can't give you a political answer. So I'm going to give you an answer that I hopefully will make sense to you. I'm married to an ex race car driver, American Le Mans. So I'm going to give you a car analogy. Um, my equivalent of a mask would be the seatbelt in the car. You know, Dean, you and I aren't that far apart in age. When we were younger and we got our first car, seatbelts weren't really known that much. And then all of a sudden we started wearing them because we were told it was safe. And we even had reminders in our car would ding when we didn't. Um, wearing a seatbelt, it does improve safety, right? There's times when maybe it doesn't, but we are learning that wearing a mask in the right setting uh, can help if you're in a group, a large group. But that in isolation isn't enough. So think about it. You can wear your seatbelt and drive 120 miles down the road and get too close to a car. It still may not protect you. It's the same with the mask. I mean, using good judgment. But if your vehicle, your body is running on high octane, you know, fuel and you've changed, you've got an oil change and you've got that body running properly, you're going to have a lot less risk of damage and danger. So fix your body, use good sense. I do think social distancing is important and mask in the right setting, wearing it on an airplane, wearing it when you're in large groups. When you're around people that you don't know. That's exactly right. Because the reality is you're being exposed to your family members anyway. Why would we wear a mask? around our family in our home. Right. What, what about the, what about the idea that the people that are at high risk, people who have a comorbidity or people um, who are elderly, they should be 
more concerned about protection, but what about the young people that are super healthy? What about getting kids back to school and all that? What are, what's your take there? I feel kids should get back to school. Um, I, I do feel that, you know, I understand we've got generations living in a home and <clears throat> there's this risk of exposure and it's not the small child we're worried about for mortalities and, and hospitalizations. It's these, um, the parents and the grandparents. So I think the most important thing we can do is exercise good judgment, but the reality is kids need to socialization. They need to be interfaced. And sometimes we need to have germs. I mean, have, being a germaphobe, that parent, um, when we were younger, those were the kids that always got sick with other like ear infections and other sicknesses. So getting these kids back in school is important. And hopefully the FDA, I just heard, um, hopefully they're going to start approving these tests. There's a saliva test that you could do at home for a dollar. And we could check little Johnny and say, okay, you're not able to transmit the virus, you can go to school today. Now, that's a whole different ballgame than saying you have the virus. You may can still carry the virus at a very low particle rate and not be able to transmit. So it, these tests are going to be critical to get out to employers and to the kids wanting to go back to school. So the parents feel safe bringing the kids back in the home with the grandparents. Or they could just uh, give the elderly people in the house or the ones with comorbidity, the Promune 200. And, exactly and right. then we, that's the much easier answer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then, and then we can get on back to a normal life. I'd love to see it. I would love to see it too, because we can't wait, you know, any longer. We need to, everybody needs to get empowered now. Well, I'm going to encourage everybody that's listened to this podcast to share it with every single person that you know, so that we can get the word out on this. Get to the show note links. Uh, you'll find Lyle Wellness there. You'll be able to order the Promoon 200. And by the way, I, I don't get anything from this, uh, Dr. Lyle, except for the pleasure of helping others. And I know that you're uh, very, very passionate about that. So thank you so much for taking time to join me here on the Guided Retirement Show. We didn't talk about money. We didn't talk about retirement. But you know what? You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have your health, it's not any good. It doesn't do you any good. I say that every day. The greatest wealth is your health. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. It's great to see you even virtually. And we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for taking the time to join me here on the Guided Retirement Show. I'm Dean Barber. Of course, you know, uh, most of the time I want to talk about money. But as I ended the show there with Dr. Lyle, if you don't have your health, the money doesn't matter. And I want everybody to take that seriously. And I want you to share this episode with your friends. Make sure that you have subscribed to the Guided Retirement Show. If you're watching us on YouTube, you need to uh, give us a thumbs up, uh, give us a like, however you do that thing to make sure that you get all the stuff on uh, YouTube. I don't know all the things about all the different uh, spaces out there that we're at, but follow us and share with your friends. And we really appreciate you joining us on the Guided Retirement Show. Look forward to talking to you next time. Investment advisory services offered through Barbara Financial Group and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. 